Greetings, everyone. Once again, it's the opportunity, the privilege that uh, I have and the uh, opportunity that we have to be able to gather around God's Word and see what it says for our lives to have an impact upon how we live and how we act. And that's really the focus of this message today. So uh, I say that in an introduction, but I say that every week. Today it is even a little more relevant as far as I can see. But um, I'm thankful that I have this opportunity and I'm thankful that it, it, I see it as a privilege. So uh, God's Word is very, very, well, it's powerful, it's sharp, it's active. It's like a two-edged sword that it literally pierces into our lives and penetrates when we allow it to, to have an impact on us. And sometimes I think we're resistant. Sometimes I think we are distracted. And I think that's all a dangerous trend that happens as we move through this life in this world today. So uh, pray with me as I start, and then we'll dig into what Nehemiah 8, 9, and 10 says. But we're also going to consider some sections from Proverbs and 2 Corinthians and Romans 5 and Galatians 5. And it's all about uh, letting go of legalism. What we're seeing here, the impression, the, the, the importance of obedience, as Nehemiah has Ezra teach the people, and obedience was a very important aspect of what had, took place there. And when we look at this, what we see today, what people ask today is, wh why do we obey? What's the importance of obedience? We're saved by grace, right? So that's where we're going with this today. And, and like I said a moment ago, we're going to pray and ask God to bless our time together. So, Father, I look to you right now, and I pray that you will help your word to become uh, very alive to me and alive to those that are listening and watching this video. I pray that we will see the impact of your living word taking root into our lives and bringing change bringing a sense of obedience to you and help us to see, Father, the exact way in which you're working in us or what you want to do as you work in us and we uh, try to be an impression upon this, this culture. We realize that we can't impress them ourselves, but we pray that you would impress them through us, Father, that you'd use us to make a difference in this society, in this culture, in this community. I pray that we would take the words of Scripture and allow them to tra transform our thinking, to make our thoughts more focused on you and on what you desire from us and for us. And I pray, Father, that as we use this passage of Scripture from Nehemiah and then others in other sections of Scripture, that we would be able to see that uh, the transforming impact upon, upon our lives is because your Word works, because your Holy Spirit's working in us and through us, and because, Father, we are followers of Jesus Christ and you're working in us to transform us and change us. So I thank you, I love you, I praise you, I ask for your blessing over this time. Use it for your glory. Please make a difference in people's lives. And I, I ask this in Jesus' powerful and precious name. Everyone said? Amen. Right. Okay, we are looking at uh, Nehemiah 8 through 10. And uh, I've got on the top of the notes. In fact, this, the title of the message, let me pause there. The title of the message is Letting Go of Legalism by Walking in the Wisdom of the Word. And sometimes I think we feel the obligation of things and we say, well, why do I need to do this? I don't want to do this. Or we feel as if that we're in a, uh, well, in a, a, a slave's perspective in that we are obligated, we're forced, and we're doing things that, uh, well, I, I have to do this because that's what I'm supposed to do. And I think there's a problem there. And I think so many times that we get wrapped up in a legalistic perspective thinking, well, okay, if I do this right, then God will bless me and I get rewards and all that. And rewards are an important aspect of what God's Word teaches. But I think we need to be cautious as we look at how legalism affects us. And uh, I've got here on the top of the notes from Galatians 5 verse 1 and then verse 13 where Paul writes and says to the Galatians, he says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. And he says, therefore, keep standing firm and do not subject yourself again to a yoke of, of slavery. 
And then he goes on in verse 13, he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, show compassionate consideration toward one another. And as I read those words, I realize that, that God gives us, as followers of Jesus Christ, a freedom because we're not under the obligations of the Old Testament law. We're not under a bunch of rules and regulations that, that God has placed upon us. And actually, the, the, the Jewish people weren't under those rules and regulations in a sense of saying, okay, this is what we do in order to find God's favor. Uh, God gave them the rules, the regulations, the Ten Commandments. The law. He gave that to them for their benefit, for their protection, for his provision upon their lives so that they'd understand that they had a need for what God provided through the Messiah coming, and, and various things like that. So we, we see that, and it's for freedom that Christ set us free. We're not under a, a, a yoke of slavery. We're not under an obligation saying, well, I have to do this or else. Now, we have to trust Christ as Lord and Savior, or else we're going to go to hell. And I believe that most everyone watching this video, I, I trust that they are truly followers of Jesus Christ who've trusted and the obligation that was fulfilled by Jesus Christ was that he, he kept the law and he was able to be the sacrifice who would be the penalty that was, would provide for us. And when we see that, we understand that. But now as we go into this passage today in, in Nehemiah 8, 9, and 10, again, I'm not going to read the whole section. I'm going to read various verses. But I want us to understand Nehemiah 1 through chapter 7 is an emphasis on the work that Nehemiah came to do in Jerusalem, and that work was to rebuild the walls, because Jerusalem was in ruins, and the, the, the enemies, the people around, they, they, they looked at the, the Jewish people, and they thought, well, you're a laughingstock. And, and they saw them as being less than what God wanted them to be, less than what Nehemiah felt that God wanted them to be. So we went to rebuild the walls and, and establish a sense of safety and security for the people in the city of Jerusalem. And then Nehemiah said, okay, my next re responsibility, chapter 7, the last section of, that, of, of chapter 7, where basically it says, in the seventh month, the people, uh, the sons of Israel were in their cities. And basically, they were in the seventh month, they built the walls, and we get to chapter 7, verse 73, through chapter 13, and the main emphasis there is worship. Worship the God Almighty. Worship God in heaven. And Nehemiah was trying to revive worship amongst the Jewish people, and to restore reverence and respect for Yahweh. And the reverence and respect for Yahweh, I think the Jewish people had a sense of reverence for him, but they were in a mess, they were in ruins, they were a laughing stock of the people around them, and the testimony of the Jewish people at that point in time was diminished. And now Nehemiah says, okay, the walls are built, so let's restore reverence and respect for Yahweh by reviving worship in the city of Jerusalem. And these last chapters are the revival of worship. And what we find there in verse 1 of chapter 8 is all the people gathered as one man as at the square which was in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra, Ezra, they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the, God, which the Lord had given to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could understand all who could listen understand on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it at the, at the, before the square. He read from early in the morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and all who could understand. And the people were attentive to the word. They were attentive. And we see that in their attentiveness, Nehemiah later, he comes to them because they're mourning over the fact that we've missed out on some things. We've made mistakes in areas. They were mourning and weeping over their sin. And Nehemiah says, okay, let's not mourn and weep. Let's move forward. Instead of mourning, let's move. And Nehemiah basically said, okay, let's continue on with the study of the word and see what it says to us. And let's make progress in reviving worship. That's what it was all about. And I think sometimes our lives 
are so wrapped up in what the world has to offer, sometimes are wrapped up in the distractions that are around us all the time. This week, <clears throat> many people are looking at the political scene with the uh, debate that's going to take place, place between the two, uh, the two main presidential candidates. I'm not going to talk politics. I'm not going to go into that in any fashion. I'm going to say very frankly, in many ways, that's a distraction to us. Is it important? Yes, I believe it is. But it's a distraction. Because sometimes we lose sight of what God is doing in our lives because we're so attentive to what, look at what's going on in the world here and look what's going on in the world there. And sometimes we need to revive worship in our lives as well. We need to restore that reverence and that respect that we should have for God Almighty. And what we see in these verses that I'm looking at, these verses in chapter 8, 9, what we're seeing here is that we need to recognize God's intended influence and impact from His Word. His Word is to speak to us. His Word is to change our perspectives and change our principles for life. And we see 2, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17, God's Word is, 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 is it's inspired. It is God's truthful, inerrant, inspired Word it's spoken by God through the prophets, through the writers of Scripture, and it is profitable to us. It's beneficial to us for teaching, for reproof, for correction when we see that we need to be reproved and change things, and then for training that we might live righteous lives so that we can be adequately equipped for the work that God wants us to be doing. And we see that in God's Word. And, and what we find in this section here is that the people gathered with anticipation. They listened attentively and they responded actively. They weren't passive about it. I think too many times we see the teachings of God's word and we say, oh, hum, I've heard this before. And I, I believe that sometimes we feel as if we're bored. I hear from different people, they're bored. I heard from somebody this week that said, you know, the, 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 the things Paul wrote in the New Testament, it bores me. I need something more, more uh, exciting. And so this person, it was recommended that they would possibly read other of the Bible stories and that sort of thing. And, and yes, there are times I think that all of us can become bored or we can, be, say, we can become lackadaisical and all of that. And we see here that God has an intended influence and impact that we should have upon our lives because of what his word says. We read further in this passage, Moses, it says that Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites, they taught the people. And they said, this day is holy. It says they basically said, calm down, be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went away to eat, drink, and to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival, because they understood the words which were made known to them. They understood those words. And basically what happened is that they came again, and they asked for more instruction. We read on verse 13 of chapter 8. It says, Then on the second day, the heads of the father's household and all the people, the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe, that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. And they began saying, we need to obey what it says. We need to be doing these things. And therefore, they asked for more instruction. And they applied what they had been taught. They applied it to their lives. They began saying, we're going to do this. And they repented for their sins and also for the sins of their ancestors. And we read on further, it says that they confessed their sins. They recognized, they, he says, he read from the book of the law daily from the first day to the last day. They celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, they had a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. And in that assembly, they, they mourned, they assembled for repentance, they prayed, they confessed. And as they recognized the history that came about as they understood what the law had said to them. They understood the things that the Jewish people had experienced previously. They understood they themselves were, had been in captivity because of the sins, the sins of the Jewish people, the sins that they'd committed. They were, they were taken into captivity as God had prophesied, had predicted what happened to them in the book of Deuteronomy. 
And as they saw the different activities, the things, the greatness of God, the guiltiness of God's people, as they saw all those things, it says that they developed a desire to set up a means by which they would obey God's word more specifically. And they said there in verse 38 of chapter 9, which is actually the first verse in the Hebrew Bible of chapter 10, but it's in our Bibles, it says, Now because of all this, because of what they understood, because of what they heard, because of what they saw from God's law, it says, We are making an agreement in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites, and our priests. And then it goes on and it lists them. And it says, The rest of the people says, We will live under this binding agreement. We will do these things. And they essentially, they made this binding agreement to obey God's word, and they put it in writing, and they put their names on the line. So we see all of this, and I just ask this question, what does this teach us, and how does it relate to our lives? Is this the way we respond to God's word? Is this what we see in God's word as we recognize what it says, that there are things that we maybe have missed. There are areas of our lives that need to be adjusted. There are responsibilities we have before God that bring honor and glory to Him. Do we see that as we read the Word? Do we ask ourselves, how do we apply this on a personal level to our lives? How do we approach the Holy Spirit saying, okay, may the Spirit guide us and direct us. May the Spirit, you know, indwell our lives. I mean, he indwells our lives the moment we trust Christ, but does he control our lives? So we ask, what does this teach us and how does it relate to our lives? Well, I want us to see that when we give God's word the appropriate attention that it deserves. And I think sometimes people have this attitude, well, okay, I'm going to have devotions today. So, you know, 10 minutes today and that'll keep the devil away. And I think that's a big mistake. Maybe 10 minutes of, of very specific meditation on God's Word. Maybe it will help us to withstand the, the schemes and the strategies of the devil. But yet, if we're just looking at God's Word saying, Okay, I do this out of obligation. There's a problem. So, but when we give the appropriate attention to God's Word that it deserves, then we should realize it will have an immediate impact on every aspect of our lives. At least it should. And I, I, I cringe, I fear sometimes that that's not happening the way it should in our lives. And, and, and that's something that I as a pastor, I look at this and say, okay, what have I done that, is, that has not been helpful or not been beneficial? How have I influenced this in any way? I have to ask myself that. But then I think every follower of Christ needs to ask himself and herself, you know, how does God's Word have an immediate impact on my life? What needs to happen? Basically, God's Word should not be merely something that is an external expression that's merely on the outside, where we try to look like we obey God's Word, but in, on the inside, in fact, we're like that child that has been placed in, in time out. And the child's in time out, and they're just wreathing in, 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 in a bit of frustration and anger. They don't want to be there. And, and they're sitting there, and basically, they're sitting there, literally, literally sitting there, but on the inside, they're saying, I don't want to be here. I don't like to do this. And I think sometimes that's the way we look at God's Word. That's, that's a difficulty. Where God's Word has an external expression, it may change the way we dress, it may, it may change the way we do things in front of other people, but does it really change us on the inside? Does it have an internal impact upon our lives? Is it bringing a change of heart? I'm, in fact, I've been told this before. I've used this as an illustration before. I decided today I would check it out to make certain. I had good, good, a good sense that it was true before this, but I looked up today. John Belushi. Many of you maybe have heard of him. Maybe some of you have not. He's an actor that's been, he's been dead for for. I think 40 years, if I'm not mistaken. And yet John Belushi grew up in Wheaton, Illinois. And I was told that he grew up and attended Awana clubs at a church in Wheaton, Illinois. 
So I checked out today and I looked up and I found pictures of John Belushi attending a WANA at a church in Wheaton, Illinois. I found pictures of that to prove it. But you know what? John Belushi died of a drug overdose. I have no idea of what was in his heart, if he had ever trusted Christ or not. I can't judge him as to whether he trusted Christ or not, because I don't know that. But I can judge the fact that his life was immoral. His life was involved in many, many things that were literally contrary to what God's Word said. But yet, I know from what I was told about his involvement in Awana, he was one of the best verse memorizers that there was in that Awana club. He won awards from his memory skills. And yet, God's Word, obviously, it had an external impact upon him. He, he won awards, but yet did it have an internal impact on him? And we'll know when we get to heaven whether it did or not. But in all reality, the testimony of his life, the end of his life was a tragedy. A tragedy because he was involved in things he shouldn't have been involved in. And therefore, God's word at one point in time and apparently had a bit of an effect because he won awards, but yet in the end, it didn't. And I wonder, okay, we can say that about him. What about our own selves? What about our lives? What about the way we allow God's word to impact us? And I'm mindful of Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11. Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11. Great passage of scripture. I'm flipping through my Bible trying to get to that. Pages stick together and, and it takes time. But we get to it and I've got one, one more page to turn. And we actually, pages stuck together again. Yes. But we get to Psalm 119 verses 9 through 11. And the question is asked by the psalmist, how can a young man, how can a young person keep his way pure? So secondly, by keeping it according to your word, by following the guidelines of your word. And then it says, with all my heart, I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word have I treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. And as the psalmist writes that, we realize that God's word, as it is tr a treasure, as it's something that, that saturates our hearts, now that's not the heart here, that's the heart here. Heart and mind are a similar perspective in scripture. Does the word of God affect our minds? Does it affect our behavior? Does it affect our lives? And I'm, I'm mindful as well of Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where we see in, in, this, in this section where uh, David writes, and again, pages stick together. It's easier for you to be patient for it is for me than it is for me to be patient right now. There it is, okay. Where David writes and says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel or the advice of the wicked nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers or scorners, but rather his delight, his exhilaration is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. God's word should have an immediate impact an immediate influence upon our lives should bring internal change so that we have a different outlook on life. We have a different perspective on life. We have a different attitude towards those that, that, that may cause us harm or cause us frustration. Those situations in life that cause us. God's word has an impact upon us in that way. So, God's intended influence and impact of his word is that it changes us. It transforms us. But what I want us to see as we continue on in this message today, I want us to see from what God's Word says to us that we need to first, or actually we can say secondly, the second point, we need to recognize God's plans and purposes regarding obedience. And we're going to base this on sections of 2 Corinthians 5, Galatians 5, and Romans 5. And yet we ask the question, does God require obedience from us? 
Am I saved because I've obeyed God's word? Is that something that is correct? No, it's not. I am not saved by my obedience. I'm saved by my trust and faith in Jesus Christ. I cannot earn my, obe- my, my salvation. I cannot earn it by obedience. I can't make myself approved by God by saying, okay, I obey the law because it says in the scriptures, it's impossible for mankind to obey the law. We can't do that on our own. So God's plans and purposes regarding obedience, why is obedience important? It's important. What does God want us to do in the whole aspect of obeying him? What's his purpose? What's his plan? Or as I say it in the notes here, what is the mandate for obedience? Well, what we understand is that God requires perfect obedience, and yet Jesus Christ fulfilled that requirement. Hebrews chapters 9 and 10 talk about how his his death once for all time, it satisfied God's justice. We read in Romans chapter 5, And I said, this is where we're going with some of this. We read in Romans 5. Sometimes I put markers in my Bible, and sometimes I don't. And I didn't today, obviously. But it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace, in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. We realize tribulations happen, knowing that the tribulation brings perseverance, and perseverance brings character, proven character, and proven character brings hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Then he says, For while we were yet sinners, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. The mandate for obedience was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. He died for me. He died for you. He paid the punishment. God requires perfect obedience, and God's justice was satisfied through Jesus Christ. So the mandate for obedience was fulfilled by Jesus Christ, and therefore we are not saved by obedience. We can't earn our salvation through that. The mandate for obedience. So God's purpose for obedience... It's fulfilled by Jesus Christ. But now, secondly, what's the motivation behind obedience? Why should we obey? Well, we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is one of my favorite passages. In fact, this for years was my absolute favorite passage in all of the scriptures. And it's still right at the top of the list where it says, we know that if the earthly tent we live in which is our house, it's torn down. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Basically, that's saying the same thing as Romans 8, 8 verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those those that are in Christ Jesus. We have a promise from God. We look forward to our place in heaven. And we know as we get to that place in heaven, as it says right here, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is the, what's our ambition, whether at home or absent, is to be pleasing to God. So the motivation for our obedience is to please God, yes, but not to please God for his approval for salvation, but rather to please God. Why? We read on, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing that the fear of the Lord is, you know, that that sense of our standing before God in judgment, we persuade others, we persuade people, we persuade men. And we are revealed to God. He knows everything about us. And I hope that we are also, as we persuade people, that you see the importance because we'll stand before Christ. But then we read on, it says now, verse 14, it says, for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, the one died for all. Therefore, all died. And it says, and he died for all so that they who live should no longer live for themselves. I don't live for myself, I live for him. I live for the one who died and rose again on my behalf. 
That's what my obedience is all about. It's the fact that I give glory and honor to God by the way I obey. The motivation for my obedience is to be a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be, you know, an example for others, to bring glory to God, to bring honor to God. And I, I don't live for myself. I live for him who died and rose again on my behalf. But now what's the method for obedience? How do I obey? How do I become an obedient follower of Christ? And that is based on God's wisdom. God's wisdom. I need God's wisdom. I need God's wisdom in my life. God's wisdom comes from his word. God's wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit who indwells our lives. God's wisdom comes from the work of God that he's doing through the Spirit in our lives. And I'm therefore, I turn to Galatians chapter 5. And in Galatians 5, what do we find? Well, we find that it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, we keep standing firm and do not subject ourselves to a yoke of bondage. We don't say, okay, I've got to obey, I've got to obey, I've got to obey, or else, or else God's going to reject me. That's not what he says here. Basically, our, our, our mandate for obedience was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Our motivation for obedience is to bring glory to him, to bring honor to him. Not to bring honor to ourselves, not to bring anything for our glory, but for his glory. And the method for obedience is basically based on, as we read on further, we go down to verse 13, it says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but rather through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you are consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For they are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you, that you please. But rather, you are led by the Spirit. And if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. They're immorality, impurity, sensuality, and all kinds of things listed there. But the fruit of the Spirit, the production of the Holy Spirit in our lives, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no, no law against these things because these things are what God's Spirit brings to us and they help us stand in in respect of the law and therefore God's method for obedience is we walk and live by the Spirit as we read what the scriptures say and what God desires we see what God's will is for our lives through that and we recognize that we need God's wisdom we need God's Spirit we need God's Word and we need God's work, God, God working in our lives through that Holy Spirit. All those things tie together. And yet I want to close this message today. I've got simple applications at the very end, but I want to close this message by looking at Proverbs 1 through 3. And this is a section of Scripture. It's much longer than I'd have time to read in this time today. I'd encourage you. It's a great devotional reading. But Proverbs 1 through 3, where we read, I'm going to read sections here. And it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Then Solomon goes on and says, listen to your father's instruction, listen to your mother's instruction and teaching. He says, wisdom shouts to us. As we look at the world around us, we see God's word in contrast to what the world is doing, and the wisdom is shouting to us and lifting her voice and saying, listen to me. Listen to the wisdom that God provides. We skip down to chapter 2. And 
And says, my son, if you receive my words, treasure my commandments within you. Make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will deserve the discern. You will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. So he's writing here and saying, wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. And we find it in God's word. We find it through the inspiration and the understanding of the Holy Spirit. We find it as we see that God is at work in us by his spirit through the teaching of his word. And we read in chapter 3 then, it says, Now, son, my son, do not forget my teaching, nor let your heart, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. He says, write them on the tablet of your heart. You'll find favor and good repute in the sight of God and in the sight of man. That's the wisdom of God. It helps us to get along in life. It helps us to get through things in life. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your human understanding, but rather acknowledge his authority in all your ways. God's in charge. God's word is true. God's will is important. Acknowledge his authority in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. He will give you the clear paths you need to follow. He says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You recognize these are evil through the teaching of the word. As we read on, he says in verse 13, he says, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom. In the man who gains understanding. For the profit of wisdom is better than the profit of silver. And her gain is better than that of fine gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways. And her paths are peace. And it reads on, it says, Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor the onslaught of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will give your confidence, give you your confidence, and will keep your foot from being caught. And as we read these things, it's important for us. In fact, I encourage everyone, read Proverbs 1, 2, and 3. But I encourage you to read that because what it does, it helps us to recognize the blessings and the benefits of God's wisdom. And I want to define these now in these next few moments. Because number one, what is wisdom anyway? What is the meaning of wisdom? We read it here in Proverbs. We read it in what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians, the wisdom of God. And you know that we, we see, you know, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. And and what is wisdom? Well, the Hebrew word for wisdom basically it is the skill to live well from an ability to discern, to distinguish, and to divide between what's good or bad, what's profitable or worthless, and what's productive or wasteful. I'm going to say that again. Wisdom is the skill to live well from an ability to discern to distinguish and to divide between good or bad, between profitable or worthless, between productive or wasteful. So that's wisdom. That's the definition of wisdom based on what God's Word says. But I want to go further than this. Because what's the source of wisdom? We've said it already as we see God's Word is the source. But yet we want to look beyond that and look to the point where we are overly human we have, we have overly humanized the whole true meaning of wisdom we say well so and so is a wise man so and so is so smart he's so intelligent we begin looking at various aspects of of IQ of intelligence of how smart someone is and we say wow look at that Look at all the things that medical technology has done for us. Look at all the things that, that research has done for us. Look at all the things that mankind has accomplished. And we've overly humanized the real meaning of wisdom. Because wisdom is God-given. 
It is a God-given skill or the God-given skill or ability to live sensibly within the guidelines of God's will. Let me say that again. Wisdom is the God-given skill or ability to live sensibly within the guidelines of God's will. It's not human intelligence. It's spiritual guidance. It's God leading us. It's God guiding us. And you know what? We have the internet, which, whoa, look at all the information that's at our disposal. We have books galore. Libraries filled with books, filled with human intelligence. They're not necessarily filled with godly wisdom. The books that are being recommended for schools these days, they are so filled with various false teachings and various ideas that are just not necessarily productive. They're not profitable. And we need to realize that we have so much, so much, we're so much impressed by human intelligence. But it's spiritual guidance which is really key. And again, I'll say this again. Wisdom is, a God, is the, not a, the God-given skill or ability to live sensibly within the confines, within the guidelines of God's will. What's good or, or bad? What's profitable or worthless? What's productive or what's wasteful? And you know what? We all have days that are productive. We have days that are wasted days. We have time where we've spent it well. We have time where we've spent it poorly. And I think we should realize that we need wisdom. Now understand, wisdom is the foundation for our obedience. We will not obey God if we don't have that sense of wisdom, what God's Word says. Wisdom of the Holy Spirit guiding and leading us. Wisdom of God working in us to make it so that we'll say, yes, I want to follow God's guidance. And as I look at what the people did in Israel back in Nehemiah's day, they heard Ezra read the word. They were attentive. They were willing to apply it to their lives. And they asked for more. And let's understand for us, wisdom is the foundation for our obedience. And I think way too many times we're getting all bend out of shape over this particular perspective or this particular idea and we're failing to recognize that we need to go back to the book. That's what Ezra did for the people and they asked for more. Now let's realize one other thing here. The force behind wisdom is what? It's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is, begin, is, is, is the foundation of what we, you know, what we need. And the force behind wisdom is that fear of the Lord, that reverence and respect for the Lord's authority over his creation. And I'm, I'm sad to say that I think too many times we are so inundated with information that distracts us that deceives us, that basically distorts our thinking, and we lose sight of that force, the fear of the Lord, the authority that God has over our lives, the reverence and respect that God deserves to have. And what do we do? That passage in Galatians chapter 5, that passage, don't turn your, free, your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh? Well, godly wisdom, that ability to discern, to distinguish, and to divide between good or bad, between profitable or worthless, between productive or wasteful, that ability to take God's word and say, okay, this is what's right, not the advice of the, the sinful as it says in, in, in Psalm chapter 1, it's the advice, advice of what God's Word says. And godly wisdom provides for us freedom to obey God's instructions. We have the freedom to obey God's instructions because the Holy Spirit is working to guide and to guard our lives from turning that freedom we have into a force that is driven by the flesh. 
And the reality is, is that sin nature that each of us has until that day we receive our glorified bodies or until that day we go spiritually to heaven, our bodies don't go to heaven till, till the rapture, but our spirits can if we pass before the rapture takes place. You know, that, that, that freedom that we have to be able to, I mean, God, God doesn't, he, he doesn't trap us into saying, well, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. God allows us to choose. And that freedom can be something that turns into an opportunity for the flesh. But godly wisdom gives us the freedom to obey. And we obey God's instructions because God's spirit is working in us to guide us and to guard us so that we'll do what's right. And as I close this today, I just have two applications, and I want this to be something that we stop and consider on a serious level. Because first off, God's Word deserves and demands appropriate attention. And I think way too many times we're attentive to way more things, and we give little time to what God's Word says. And I, and I, I find it myself. I get, it gets squeezed out. There are two things that get squeezed, get, get squeezed out of my life sometimes. My prayer time and my Bible time. Because so many things are going on around me. So many things are happening. And God's word deserves and demands our appropriate attention. Just like the, the people in Nehemiah's day, they asked Ezra, teach us more. Teach us more. Teach us the word. But now secondly, God's Word needs to be applied to each of our lives each and every day. And just like the, the, the John Belushi, the actor, he memorized God's Word when he was a child. We don't know what happened, but yet his life was a tragedy. Or I can point to others as well, but that's not necessarily a safe because people may think, well, hey, he's talking about me. I'm talking about specifically specifically. John Belushi in that illustration, but now I'm talking about Greg Dykstra. Because there are moments when I need to apply God's Word. I need to say, okay, this is what God's Word says, so therefore, that's what I need to do. And the people in Israel, they saw the Feast of Booths, we need to do that. The Day of Atonement, we need to do that. Separate ourselves from the pagans that live around us, we need to separate ourselves. We need to be clear about the Sabbath. That's what they said then. We don't have the Sabbath today, but yet we have instructions from God that says we ought to, we ought to spend ample time with Him, meditating on His Word, memorizing His Word, basically asking ourselves, how is it that we can do better in order to bring honor and glory to God Almighty? Hey, that's our message. Thank you for watching. Let's pray as we close, all right? Father, I thank you for your word. That's what we've talked about through this time. And I realize that this is a repetitive thing. We've talked about it in previous messages. But Father, I don't think any of us can say that we're spending too much time in your word. None of us, none of us can say that. Because there are areas of our lives that are lacking. There are areas of our lives where we're not finding the appropriate application of how we should do things in the way that honors you most. And I pray, Father, that you'd guide us in this, help us in this, lead us in this. May this be a foundation for us today that might bring revival to each of our individual lives. I pray that there might be revival in our church, there might be revival in our community. There might be a sense where people recognize how they can allow your word to just strengthen their obedience in a way that, yes, it's not, it's not done to earn our salvation, but rather it's done to show that we are saved, show that we are following Jesus Christ. So help us, Father, lead us in this. Again, I thank you, I love you, I praise you, and I ask your blessing upon each of our lives, upon each of our, our, our roles as followers of Christ, and upon our church. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Lord bless. I just trust that God can use this for His glory. And I, I just love the privilege that I have in being able to teach His Word. So uh, may God bless.